Once again, let me please request everyone other than the speaker to mute yourself and switch off the video for smooth transmission. There's a lot of interruptions are there. Um, it is a great pleasure to welcome Professor Poshan Lo from Carnegie Mellon University, USA. He is the coach of the USA Mathematics Olympiad team and is known also for his books on Olympiad uh, problem solving. Poshan Lo remarkably believes that anything is possible, even reinventing learning. Sometime back, you must have heard of this quadratic equation. Maybe perhaps we'll talk about it later. Um, he founded expi.com, expii.com, if you have heard about it. It's an innovative, uh, free personalized learning platform where students have the power to choose how they learn. This is supported by his online series of you know, daily challenge math classes for middle school students. So this XP is a social uh, enterprise that provides free creative and novel lessons to the world to make education and intellectual curiosity accessible to all. So during this COVID-19 outbreak, he turned his attention to creating something called Novid, that is N-O-V-I-D, the world's first COVID-19 app demonstrably capable of measuring distance with submeter accuracy. So let me just uh, say a little bit uh, uh, about this topic. Professor Poshan Lo, first of all, will be presenting using a technique that allows him to handwrite. As you will see, he's not, uh, he's doing something new to us. It works with Zoom and does not even need screen sharing, as you can see. The entire image that he translates to us will come as if it's coming from a single webcam. It's also novel for us. Uh, except that it is already, it will already include his handwriting also. The title of his talk is Mathematics versus COVID-19. Now I'll read out his brief description of this topic. The COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted daily life across the globe. What, is, what does a biological phenomenon have to do with mathematics? Quite a lot, as it turns out. One uniquely devastating characteristic of COVID-19 is that it transmits before symptoms appear. To fight this, the concept of contact tracing has become part of common conversation as a standard method of fighting contagious, this contagious disease. Mathematically, that is based on graph theory and probability. Leveraging his research expertise in these areas, the speaker recently introduced, introduced this NOVID, a new and different way to perform contact tracing, which allows people to protect themselves before being exposed to COVID-19, as opposed to only isolating people after exposure. Since the speaker is actually a mathematics educator, he will give this talk in a style which contains parts that can be used by teachers to explain the relevance of the mathematics taught at all levels in relationship to the single greatest issue at this time, COVID-19. The talk will also be delivered in a style that demonstrates online teaching techniques. So you can see, you can take away a lot of things from this talk. I invite Professor Poshan Lo to take over now. Please come. Wow. Well, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be able to give this talk and good evening to everybody. Actually, I enjoy interacting with the education uh, community and all communities from India. I used to travel to India quite a lot. In fact, well, before the COVID-19 made it impossible to travel all around the world. Now, this particular topic is going to be about COVID-19, but I know this is a math education conference. So I should first of all say I'm actually a math educator. Uh, my entire work and my entire background has all been around coaching mathematics, teaching mathematics at lots of different levels. I am a math professor at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I also am the national coach of the USA International Math Olympiad team. That's actually how I got to know your, your organizers, because I happened to meet them at international competitions where they were bringing the Indian team. Now, uh, some people also have noted that I also do quite a lot of work on YouTube. And that's because I, as the US national coach of the Math Olympiad team, I used to travel around to lots of different cities, basically every single weekend in the United States before COVID. And then once COVID struck, I decided to go and take everything I was doing online because I wanted to continue to keep trying to reach lots of people. I'm actually very happy to see that when I do my YouTube streams, oftentimes these are live streams, I have quite a few people who are watching who are students or adults in India. And so it's fun to be able to work all around the world. Now for today's topic, I actually wanted to focus on what I've spent most of my recent time working on. My recent time, I've actually switched a little bit from working on mathematics education into working on controlling COVID. You might wonder why. Actually, I'll tell you one reason why. It's because as an educator, and I'm sure many of you can, uh, can also feel the same way, as an educator, it's very hard to educate remotely. 
it's very, I, I really enjoy working with students. And the best way to work with students is when you can see them, when you can talk to them, when they have less uh, friction, when it's easier for them to raise any concerns, when you can see the expression on their face and then see what they might need. These are what we need. And unfortunately, there's no way to bring this back unless we control COVID. But there's a second reason why I got involved in COVID. It's because it turns out that my area of research in mathematics is network theory. And that happens to be deeply related to controlling COVID. And so in March, I got some ideas. And after I got the ideas and I didn't see anyone else in the world using them, I just started running. I said, if no one else will do it, I will make things work this following way. And I'll tell you a little bit about these ways today in the talk. But one other reason I want to talk about this topic is because oftentimes we mathematics teachers, mathematics educators have to answer questions from students saying, what is this mathematics that we're learning? Is it ever going to be useful? And we often come up with some stories of, well, you know, if you went to the market and uh, you had, you know, this amount of money and you bought something, you make change, right? These are, these are simple examples. But it turns out that COVID-19 is a huge problem. No one will argue with its importance. And it also turns out there's a lot of math inside it. So I want to use this, I'll talk for about an hour and then I'll take questions. I want to use this hour to talk about some of the mathematics that appears inside COVID-19. It will touch on math at many different levels in school because I know that there are many different levels of teachers. I don't mean levels of teachers, not that you guys are different levels. I mean many different levels you are teaching, right? There are many different levels that you're teaching. And so hopefully, no matter what you're teaching, you'll find something that you can grab here and maybe use it in your class as an example. For this, I'm going to now switch to something where I'm going to present from my screen. Uh, share, share, uh, share something. So over here now, I have uh, I have some I have some picture which is actually from it's from an article in a famous publication called Nature Medicine. Now, Nature is one of the most prestigious scientific journals in the world, and Nature Medicine is uh, is, is one of their one of their branches. Actually, as I'm giving this talk, I'm also trying to demonstrate different ways that you could try to use technology. So we can we can talk a little bit about that at the end. And maybe I'll, I'll even make some comments in the middle. So I'm both giving a talk about math and also giving a talk about the talk. But that's because you're educators. So if you can see, I actually don't like just sharing a screen. I like being in front of the screen. And the reason is because then I can point, right? It's very useful to be able to just point directly. So what I have here is I want to talk about a graph. It, it, well. Yeah, what we usually call a graph, it's a chart. And this is maybe the usefulness of being able to visualize data on a chart and to interpret it. So this is a chart of SARS. And what about SARS? This is a chart about how the spreading is for, uh, for SARS. In, in other words, how the viral shedding, uh, that's what it says here, viral shedding infectiousness, how that changes over time. And this is maybe a, a reason why I started realizing how important it was to do a certain angle of control on COVID. You see, because as a mathematician, if you're thinking about COVID, why is COVID so much worse than other diseases? Is there anything unique about it? Well, you might say, well, COVID is new. But every time we have an influenza, the new version of the influenza is new every year. Why is that? A, that's not a problem, right? So what's so special about COVID? Well, first to do that, let me go back in history and look at SARS 2003. And in SARS 2003, this is the important chart. Uh, you can see in terms of days from the symptom onset of when you have primary case uh, of the primary case, meaning this is from days after the primary case is the person who just got sick. Days after the person got sick and started having symptoms, how many days after symptoms were they spreading the virus? And the way you read this chart is that at zero days after getting sick, the height of this chart is practically zero. So you're spreading virtually nothing. At approximately maybe nine days after your symptoms start with the original SARS, then you're spreading at maximum, meaning that as you're walking around in public, you're spreading the disease in the most that you do. And this is related to some areas of math, whether it be math of how you interpret a chart to mathematics of area under a chart. I'm actually just looking at the comments at the same time. Okay, great. So what, well, how we interpret this chart, of course, is the most spreading happens there, which is approximately nine or 10 days after you start having symptoms. And if you want to look at a chart like this, you don't just look at how high it is, you actually look at the area under the curve because the way it works is in some sense, this, this curve represents all of the virus that you're going to spread. 
And so the amount of spreading that's happening before five days, the amount of spreading that happens before five days is the area under this curve in terms of a fraction. The fraction of the spreading you do is the area under this curve divided by the, the area under this curve in that bit right here, divided by the area under the curve altogether. And this is actually a concept from calculus. However, you can explain this concept even to younger people. And it makes sense because the, the, the taller the curve, the more you're spreading. So you're spreading faster. You're spreading much more. Not faster is the wrong word. Spreading much more. And so the area is how you keep, is, is, a, is a way of averaging. It's a way of seeing whether you're spreading, you know, over here you're spreading very little over any given time. So even though you spread it over five days, it doesn't make much difference. So that was the first graph. The first graph is the SARS-2003. And this is also why the way that the world controlled SARS-2003 was after people start to have symptoms, then you try to quarantine them and you control it. And it's okay because you have some time. They don't really spread that much until five plus days after. I want to compare that with some other graphs. So if I scroll down a little bit, this graph is for the seasonal influenza, the normal flu. Maybe I'll stand over here. So the normal flu, if you look at this graph, it's interesting. Suddenly, this days from symptom onset, meaning after somebody gets sick, how many days after the symptoms started and, and seeing how the spreading goes, you see it goes to minus two. So this is interesting. This shows that the flu starts to spread two days before you have symptoms. Actually, you may have heard COVID. Many people talk about COVID and say COVID spreads two days before you have symptoms. Well, so does the flu. But how is, why is the flu not as bad? Well, the reason is because of the mathematical concept, right? This is why I, I drilled so hard on the previous idea of the area under the curve being what's important. Because you see, even if you start spreading two days before symptoms, if you're not spreading much, look at the height of the curve. If you're not spreading very much, then it's not a big deal. It's not a big fraction of the total. Again, the fraction of the flu that spreads before you know you are before you know you have any symptoms is the fraction of the area under the curve, which is this part, divided by the area under the whole curve, which is tiny. So in that sense, yes, the flu spreads before you have symptoms, but not much. Most of the spread is after. Now let me go to SARS, uh, not SARS. Let me go to COVID. And now this is not as colorful of a chart. This is this is not my chart, by the way. This is from this Nature Medicine, but this particular chart uh, indicates that it's quite different. Actually, if you look at this chart, let me, let me kind of scroll here. Yeah, if you look at this chart, what you see is days after symptom onset, here's zero. Zero is in the middle. And if you look at that, that makes you see that, you see the problem with COVID is that it's starting to spread before you have the disease. So not just starting to spread before the, the disease, but if you look at the fraction of the area that's on this side, which is below zero, that fraction of the area, the scientists estimated, was 44% of the entire area. So the situation with COVID was that COVID is spreading in such a way that nearly half of the spreading happens before you even know you're sick. And I'm, I'm talking about this in this way because oftentimes when we explain mathematics to people, what do students think about mathematics? A lot of times students think that mathematics is just a bunch of problems that you're supposed to do in some normal ways. I would actually argue that's not what mathematics is only about. Those are, those, are, those are useful tools and we need to learn those. But the reason we want to learn those tools is so that we can apply them whenever we need to. And in this COVID situation, what you do when you think like a mathematician is you say, what is unique about the situation? And can we boil down to a few pieces, which are the unique bad things about COVID. Because if we see those, then we can try to come up with ideas to control. And what we've just talked about here are some ideas, a little bit from calculus, and also ideas about why graphs are useful, and maybe some ideas from probability or statistics. Okay, but now we have this critical observation that there's some problem here of spreading before you even know you have it. And that is the, that's actually one of the main reasons why COVID is a problem now. From the point of view of being a teacher in a school, this is also something that we care a lot about because I don't know how you're doing it in India, but in the United States, some of the schools actually have students going back in person. And if you have people going back in person, then we, are already, we already now know it's very, very dangerous in this part. 
And so there are students who don't even have any cough. They don't have any fever. They have nothing funny, but just from their breathing, they are spreading COVID. And so this is, this is just useful to, to put all of this stuff in perspective. Okay. Well, now what I want to do is I want to switch from this observation into some ideas of how you might try to control. And we will come back to here. This is actually very useful. For that, I need to be able to draw. So I'm going to switch to something that I can draw on. This is a computer. This is actually the tablet that I used to draw on. And so now I want to talk a little bit about what, 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 what we do when we try to control the spread of a disease. And you may have seen a lot of people talking about something called R0. So this is R0. R0 is a, is a technical term in epidemiology when you study the spread of a disease. But I think it's nice to talk about just because, again, if, you, if you're teaching any classes that have anything to do with multiplication or exponentials, this is actually useful. So R0, what is R0? R0 is roughly defined as for each person who gets infected, the average number of other people that they infect. For a newly infected person, the number of other people they infect. OK, so that's what I have for my R0. Now, you, 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 the reason why this is important is because, uh, as, as you know, you guys are, are math teachers. If you have something where the R0 is bigger than 1, then you have an exponential explosion. So unfortunately, I'm just going to write down some unfortunate thing. Unfortunately, R0 for COVID Nobody really knows, but you, you, we've heard things of something like two, two, three. And by the way, R0 is some number, I guess. And it's, it's not two, it's not three, it's just, some, it's just some real number. And unfortunately, it's somehow somewhat big. And the, pro oh, I should also say, depends on the country, but I'll get back to that soon. So this R0 thing, why is it relevant? It's because, well, suppose it was two. So suppose it was two. If it was two, uh, now the reason why this is bad is there's some famous story even of, a, of a, I think there was a, a king and somebody asked the king for one grain of rice uh, and then maybe every single day they would ask for the number of grains to be doubled. This is a famous story. And after 30 days, you have so much rice that, uh, you know, it's, it's somehow like billions, billions of grains of rice. But the problem with the R0 of two is because then what you end up happening, what ends up happening is that uh, initially, You have one infected, and then that gives you two more infected, and then the two gives you four more, and then the four gives you eight more, and so on. And you can see it's blowing up. You can see that this thing is just causing an exponential blow up. It's two to the power n. Uh, that's the number of the people that you infect in the nth round. And so since two to the power n just grows and grows and grows, then you have a problem because it gets out of control. And you can actually even overrun a billion people this way. This is exponential, right? Now, of course, if R0 was less than one, then you're in good shape. Because as we know from exponentials, if you take 0.9 to the power n, well, that just goes down to zero. So this is, the, this is something useful if you're talking about exponentials at all inside your classroom. The idea that this R0 is something which, if R0 is bigger than one, you get an exponential graph which looks like this. If R0 is less than one, you get an exponential graph that looks like this. So the key is if R0 is less than one, then the infection dies out. OK, but now I want to talk about something. You see, in the R0, if you look at the newspapers and you look at everyone talking on the, on the news, they all talk about R0 as if it's a magical number, as if it's one number. And at the same time, I also said this comment about how it depends on what country you live in. How can that be? COVID is not supposed to really care too much about what country you live in. Now, granted, there are some genetic aspects, so it could be that 
it happens to infect people of certain backgrounds more than others. But also, there are many countries where, have, where there are people with similar genetic makeups. For example, in the United States and in Europe, it's quite similar. But how can they have different R0s? Well, that's going to bring in another concept from math. Now, this concept from math is something which, yes, population density, I saw someone comment that, and I want to talk about it from a point of view of mathematics that's related to something called graph theory. But this is a different kind of graph. So this is not something that you learn in school, usually, at least not in the US, but it's something that's quite easy to explain to people if they want to know something about the R0. So what is graph theory? Now, graph theory is talking about a different kind of a graph. So in graph theory, the graph is something that looks like this. A graph is a bunch of points connected by a bunch of lines. The lines can cross, and you can have multiple lines like this. You can make, you can make funny shapes. You can have crossing lines. Oops, I missed, so I'll just draw another dot. I'll draw another line. OK, I draw all of this. This is, this is a graph. And what a graph can represent is it represents uh, a network. It represents a conne some connectivity between people. Because indeed, the way you think of it is that each of these nodes is a person. And now once you look at this, you can see, ah, that's, that's actually what this might have to do with COVID-19 in the sense that maybe these are people who spend time with each other. So somebody did make a comment about population density. Population density is part of it in the sense that if you have a very high population density, then your graph will have many, many more edges. They're called edges. You know, you might have lots and lots of connectivity between all of these, and maybe they may even go far, right? This is an example of a dense graph. More contacts, exactly. But now I want to talk about this R0. I'm going to write a question mark here. What is this R0 thing anyway? What if, what if you had a very strange society and your strange society happens to just have everybody living in a row and nobody talking to anyone except the person next to them? So what if your situation looked like this? So this is a strange country. I mean, a very, very strange country where everybody only talks to the person that lives next door to them and doesn't talk to anyone else. In this strange country, suppose what happens is that this one's infected. What happens? Is it going to be that the exponential growth is going to happen? Actually, when you look at this graph, it's funny. And, and by the way, I'm talking about the real COVID. Imagine that COVID actually struck in a country where the country looked like this. If COVID actually struck in that country with the same COVID that's striking everywhere in the world, it's not going to grow exponentially. It's going to grow linearly. And this is also useful if you're talking about maybe in, in America, we call this class algebra two, but in India, you maybe have a class also, which is where you're a bit more sophisticated than the normal algebra class. And usually in America, we take this in, in, in high school. And then somehow you start talking about the notions of linear, quadratic, exponential, and over here, the situation is, you see, we also need to do some mathematical modeling. The mathematical modeling is, you know how COVID spreads. COVID is not like the movies where you touch someone and they immediately turn into a zombie, right? And then they touch somebody and they immediately turn into a zombie. What happens in COVID is that even though this person's infected, it might take five days for that person to get infected. And then it'll take five days for that person to get infected. And then five days for that person to get infected. Actually, every person might only infect one person. And that's even, that, that, would, that would be if you're guaranteed to infect each person. Actually, there's an interesting thing about COVID we're soon going to find out, which is that if you have an infected person next to a non-infected person, it's not 100% that you're going to infect. It's not 100% at all. And so actually what would happen here is that this person might infect a few and then the whole thing dies out. And it dies out meaning there's no more, no more COVID. So once you look at this, you find out that R0 is actually not really the right number. Why is everyone talking about R0? It's because unfortunately, the concepts mathematically might be too sophisticated and too complicated to explain to, uh, to the, common, uh, the, the general public. But at the same time also, it could be that people don't know what the network looks like. What I want to emphasize here is R0 is actually network dependent.
Okay, so it's actually not that there's one R0 for every country. Honestly, it's more like there's an R0 for the general population type, meaning what is the genetic background, and also the maybe level of care that people are taking. Are you wearing masks? But once you put those down, you also need to take into account what is the network? Because if you have this big linear network, it doesn't even matter what your spreading looks like, in the, what, your, what the likelihood of spreading looks like, because you most likely will only be, if it looks like this, you'll only be able to go one step at a time, okay? So in that case, if we want to mathematically look at this, what should we be looking at? I, again, we have mathematics teachers here, right? It's that, you see, I would boil things down to saying there's a network part and there is a person to person part. Meaning for every infected person, if that infected person has one of these edges, one connection to another one, there is a probability that the infection jumps. And there's a probability that the infection jumps you know, for each of those people. So for example, if this is an infected, then there's a probability. There's a probability of the infection jumping over there over there and over there. And each of those has a probability. Each connection has a probability of getting the infection. Right? So at that point, this R0 is actually a composite. It's, it's putting together this probability and also these things called the degrees. It's like, how many connections do you have? So I, I do have to say, this is still simplifying a little bit because of the fact that if somebody is infected, certain people are what are called, well, people suspect that certain people are super spreaders, meaning that when they get infected, they infect lots of other people and some other people maybe not. But because of something called linearity of expectation, it's, it's something about expected values. It actually turns out that you know you can you can roughly uh, you can roughly approximate things by saying, in general, for every person to person edge, what is the chance that the infection jumps across that edge? And then this R zero is in some sense multiplying this probability, this average probability, by this average degree. It's like about how how interconnected the graph is. I'm just looking at the comments. One bad thing about my setup is that I haven't yet set up something where I can put the Zoom comments closer. So I always have to lean in a little bit closer to read this. Uh, at the end of the talk, we'll be taking all this comments. Oh, oh okay, okay. We'll, we'll, take, we'll take questions at the end. That sounds, that sounds good. Okay. And actually, somebody was talking about the lockdown. Actually, when you do a nationwide lockdown, you know what you do to this graph? You basically turn this graph well, since I saw that, that, that's actually useful because uh, let me write down what I was about to say, which is that this thing is showing that R0, I'm writing approximation here because this is not really like rigorous, rigorous, but from a, from a big averaging perspective, you can see that R0 is something like you take the probability of infecting along one connection multiplied by the average number of connections that a person has. Does that make sense? And this is sort of like from the point of view of probability theory, it's not exact. And the reason I say that is because as you know, if you teach probability, there's a notion of independence. And so we don't actually have independence here, but we're doing big, sweeping statements anyway. I, I mean, nobody really knows what R0 is, so we need to approximate. And we can estimate that maybe if everyone has some number of connections, then you multiply that by the probability that each one on average will go across. And actually, when you look at this, now we can go and talk about something which I had mentioned over here, which was, you know, what is the chance? If you stand next to someone who's infected, what's the chance that you get infected? Well, now we can actually estimate that, right? You see, we, we, we know that in, I, I don't know the, 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 the R0 in India as much. I knew the R0 is in Western countries, but it, even in the Western countries, which are not as dense, densely populated, what they had is the R0 was around two to three. And the average number of connections per person 
If you were thinking about what life was like back before COVID, the number of people that I might see over the course of the one week where I could potentially infect people might be about 20 or 30 people, which I spend 15 minutes within two meters of easily. I, actually, when I went to the Romanian Masters of Mathematics, which was in, in February, oh my gosh, how many people was I within two meters for 15 minutes of? Probably like 100 people because this was a big event. There were students everywhere. And oh yeah, of course, any teacher. Teachers are spending tons and tons. But I'm going to say, you know, if this was two to three, then even if this was 20 to 30, even if there were 20 or 30 average number of connections per person, what would we get? We'd get the probability of infecting if you stand next to someone of only 10%. So being right next to somebody who has COVID, being six feet, sorry, we use feet in America, being two meters away from somebody who is COVID positive for 15 minutes is not a death sentence. Actually, once you look at this, then it starts to look like no big deal. So maybe we should just go ahead and do everything as normal? Well, no. The reason is because, unfortunately, if you do everything as normal, you have too many connections per person. So once you multiply them, then you get a number bigger than one. But this is already starting to indicate that this number, we need, to take, we need to take this number into account whenever we're thinking about what kind of interventions we might take. And of course, if you're going to teach a classroom in the United States, typical classroom might have 30 students. And if you're going to do 30 students times the 10%, unfortunately, that's pretty big. And in fact, the chance that you would get it is actually quite high. Actually, you wouldn't do it that way. You wouldn't, you wouldn't multiply these two to find the chance that you'd get it. Um, this is being used to calculate what's called the expected value, which is on average how many more people are going to get infected. But you could also do the math to figure out what's the chance that you'd get it. Uh, okay. One question in between, I just want to... Oh, yes, sure. Uh, one question somebody is asked. Isn't the probability of infection on an edge dependent on connectivity as well? Ah, isn't the probability of connection on an edge dependent on connectivity as well? Yes. So the way I'm thinking about this is there is an underlying graph, this, this blue thing. And if you know the underlying graph, then if there's a probability that each of these is causing an infection, then you'd basically, if you want to know this guy's infected, on average, how many other people are they going to infect? You would add up the probabilities of infecting on each of these edges. This is this notion of expected value. The expected number of people you infect is the sum of the probabilities that you infect this one and this one and this one. And also the edges, uh, this is also a delicate point. The edges are not all equal in the sense that some of these edges are you live in the same household. <laughs> and you should almost think of that as having many edges between you and that same vertex because you have many opportunities. This is the notion of a weighted graph. We don't draw many edges. Instead, we could think that there's a higher probability that you go along that edge. But yes, so, so, so basically what I'm trying to say here is this is very rough. I, this, is, this is very rough because it's not taking into account that when you live with somebody, that power of that edge is a huge multiplier. However, the reason why it's still okay to do this kind of averaging is because I actually wanted to use this to drive home this point. This point here is something that many people didn't notice. I didn't know this either. At the beginning, when I was thinking about COVID, I thought that if you were within two meters for 15 minutes, I thought that meant you were going to get it. And it turns out that's not the case. Uh, but at the same time, 10%, you should still be careful because there's a, there's a game that is bad to play called Russian roulette, where you put a bullet in a gun and the gun has six chambers and you shoot the gun and one of the people out of the six dies. That's a chance of 16% which is not much more than 10%, but somehow that's bad, right? So 10% so is actually bad. However, the problem is it's inconvenient because now let's talk a little bit about how people try to control COVID. And we were talking about quarantine. We were talking about isolation. These are all methods that are being used in the United States as well. And so in the US, if there's somebody who is infected, the standard protocol is to do contact tracing, to go and find out who they have been around so the graph is relevant, find out who they've been around and attempt to isolate all of these people so that these people are removed from society temporarily and tested. But once you see this of something like 
What that indicates is that if you use only the quarantine and, iso and isolate method, you might be quarantining 10 times as many people as you need to. And this is why, unfortunately, our economies are crashing. It's because once people find out they need to quarantine so many, then they lock down the entire city or the county. And then that causes, of course, infection to drop, but also people, people's livelihoods disappear. So what we're seeing here is with this particular way of intervention, unfortunately, due to this biological issue, and by the way, my 10% is not accurate. Maybe it's 20%, maybe it's 1%, but it's not 100%. That's my whole, my whole point here. It's not 100%. And when you have this big factor of extra quarantine, maybe that alone is not a powerful enough tool. So that's where we got some idea. So the, the thing that I ended up working on is to use this network to try to help people avoid getting COVID in a different way that actually works together with what you see here, but is complementary in that it's actually another powerful way of reducing the R0. And I'll also talk a little bit about how the app that we eventually built also automatically collects this blue network. But first I want to talk about why this is a big deal. So for that, I need to switch to another part of this, this screen. So this is, this is actually what our app provides. We've made an app, the app is called Novit. And what Novit does is it gives anyone who's using the app, once, once this app starts to deploy in an area, once it starts to be used in an area, then anyone who has the app has access to something that looks like a weather radar, except that it's for COVID except that it's for COVID. Let me explain. So here's a graph and I'm gonna play this, I'm gonna play this video a couple of times. So here, what I have is the date is changing. And what you're seeing is that these red bars are getting bigger and bigger and they're approaching you. Well, you is, is me, which is over here, this is you. And if I'm just gonna keep playing it as I, as I talk about what this does. So this is a graph, it's a chart where the date is changing, June 7, June 8, and so on. And you can see that the red bars are getting more numerous. What are the red bars? Well, the red bar is indicating the number of COVID cases that are at that particular degree of connection away from you. That's a graph theoretic distance. So specifically, what this means right now in this particular graph is that there's one COVID case that is 10 degrees of separation away from me. But as the time goes forward, I find that the COVID cases are getting more numerous and also at lower degrees of separation away from me. What's a degree of separation? Well, we use that word only because many people weren't comfortable with the notion of graph theoretic distance. That was just not a, a commonly stated of term. That was just not a commonly stated term. And so what we have here, let me just give a, a very brief explanation of what is the graph theoretic distance. If I want to know the distance between here and here, what's that graph theoretic distance? Well, the distance is obviously one, two, three, right? Three steps away. No, it is three steps away in that, in that regard, but it's actually also two steps away, one, two. So because it's actually two steps away, two is the closest, right? So we say that this, if this was you, then we'd say that this is a distance two away from you because there exists a path where it only uses two connections in order to get there. If I wanted to know how many degree, how, what's my degree of connection from me to the infected? Oh, I don't know, what is this? Uh, let's try. So if it's one, two, three, four, I see I can get there in four steps. Oh, wow, one, two, three. So you see graph theory is complicated. You, you, how would you even find the shortest distance, uh, the shortest path? That's an algorithmic problem. And in fact, deep into how our whole system works, how Novid works, there's a lot of algorithmic work to make sure that even if we got 1 billion people using the system, the computer can still calculate it fast enough. And as you can see, it's tricky because you, you have to try a lot of different paths. And finally, I find that it's one, two, three is the shortest. So that's three away. But let me go back to the display here. So what we do here is we then show uh, for, for you, just specifically for you, we show you how the infection is getting closer to you over time. And the relevance of this is that this gives you your personal COVID radar, radar, which lets you decide what to do. 
This is very different from contact tracing. In contact tracing, you can imagine that contact tracing is like having only you and first. You only get one piece of information. You cannot see anything else that's over on this side. All you know is that, I don't know, I don't see anything, nothing, 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 and suddenly it's right next to you. And then when, it, when they tell you it's right next to you, then you're asked that you have to quarantine, isolate, do all of these things because you have already been exposed. That's the notion of what's called exposure notifications. There are exposure notification apps already all over the place. I believe India actually also has, right? You have exposure notification apps. And so what those are supposed to tell you is if you have already been exposed, meaning that it's at distance one, then you should take some action because at that point, you might be a danger to society. To society. So those are apps that protect other people from you. What we made with Novid is we made the first app that protects you from other people. And this is a very important flip. Again, as a mathematician, you need to think about the, the base, uh, the, the core of what you're doing and why, it was, why it's different, why it will work. Ours was the first app that protects you from others instead of protecting others from you. Because if you can see COVID coming, then as it comes closer, then you decide you are gonna be careful. Not because anyone told you that you need to be careful to be a good citizen. No, just because you're a selfish person who wants to protect yourself and maybe you care about your family too, so you wanna protect your family. But what I'm saying is that this, by, by being able to see things from far away, you actually are able to turn a problem from being one of civil responsibility and public duty into one of pure selfishness of anyone who wants to protect themselves, this is useful. I give another analogy. This graph is sort this, this chart is sort of the same idea as giving you headlamps for your car to drive at night. Imagine you're driving at night in the out, outside of the city, no other lights. If you have no lights on your car, and if there's no moon, I guess right now we're close to full moon, so now you can still see, but if there's no moon, it's very dangerous to drive your car. You might crash into something in the street. Who knows what's in the street? That's COVID. The reason why we have this big mess right now is nobody has any clue where COVID is. They only find out when they crash into it, when it's right there, and then it's, oh, too late. And that's why you get some countries like the United States, which is where I am, where you have lots and lots and lots of cases. We've just invented headlights. <laughs> this thing is like headlights. You can then see from far away, where is the COVID? And now the fun thing is that if you think about that analogy, who wouldn't want to turn on their headlights when they're driving in the dark? Do you see what I mean? It's like somehow once you flip the incentives this way, of course you want your headlights. What kind of an idiot would choose to drive a car in the dark with no headlights if there's no moon? Of course they want the headlights. And so that was the key. We've actually made this app and this app makes it possible for people to actually want to participate. I'm happy to say that the app is already being used. Actually, there's a famous university in the United States called Georgia Institute of Technology, Georgia Tech. And they've actually started using this thing already. And that's, this is already connecting up their entire student and um, well, and also faculty and staff, everybody into this network. And so this is, this is one way that we're able to keep people safer. Actually, we'd love to work with people from India too. There's no reason why this can't work everywhere in the world. Now I need to explain what goes on underneath. How can you make something like this? Well, there's more math. So in order to make that graph that I just showed you, this chart, this chart has two things. Again, as a mathematician, I'm breaking it down into the, two, into the core pieces. One piece is, how do you know who's positive? The second piece is, how do you know who's connected to who? These are two separate problems. The easier problem to solve is how do you know who's positive? Well, we made an anonymous app. So the way this app works, you don't even give it your mobile number. So you just download the app called Novid, you turn it on and you don't tell it your name, you don't tell it your email address, you don't tell it anything, you don't tell it even your GPS. Actually, we don't use GPS, GPS identifies you. If you have a GPS tracker, then what the GPS can do is it can look at where you are at three o'clock AM and it will have a guess of who you are because that is probably your home. Now, because we don't use the GPS, our app is completely anonymous, and therefore, people can press a button into it to report positive, and it is still anonymous. We have no way of knowing who this was, and we have various ways of working with, count, with, 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 uh, 
regional governments where the regional government can even help us authenticate that this person was positive. And we can do it in an anonymous way where we still don't know who the person is. It's just that the regional government tells us this user ID. Well, actually, they won't say with this user ID. They'll give a code. And, 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 and then if a code gets entered into the app, well, then that means that this was a legitimate infection. But we don't know who it was. And we don't want to know. For the last bit, I want to talk a little bit about this blue graph, like this blue network. So how do you get this? So this, and yeah, people are saying this, yeah, this needs, yeah, I mean, we do, we do hope that this technique gains attention, by the way. The reason that we hope this technique gains attention is because it's actually different. It's fundamentally different from, uh, from the quarantine isolation and contact tracing. It's a fundamentally new approach to how you would control the spread of a disease using 21st century technology. And you, you might ask, how can we control R0? Oh, I should tell you, the reason why this thing will reduce R0 is it is not designed just to go and say, we isolate off the people who are close to the ones who are infected. That's what we are already doing. With other, that's what other people are already doing. Let them keep doing it. It's important. What we do instead is we make it so that whenever the infection starts to get close to somewhere, then you get scared. What we are intending to do is that whenever the infection starts striking closer and closer and closer to you, you get scared. And rightfully so, you should be scared because this is dangerous and it's getting close to you. When you get scared, what do you do? You put on a mask. Actually, you might put on an even better mask. In my house, we have a few better masks, but those you cannot wear too many times. I want to know when I, want, when I, when I should use those, right? You start taking bigger caution, more caution. Other things, if you go out into public, you, if you know that the COVID situation is getting close to you, you start to spend more distance away from people because you just know that you need to be careful. And by doing this, we actually decrease these yellow probabilities. Right, These yellow probabilities, back in the day, long time ago, no one was wearing masks, and it was around 10%. Well, what if both people are wearing masks? Then maybe the, the, the probability that, that it jumps is even less. Or another thing that we know in, in the studies now is that the thing spreads more inside, and it spreads less outdoors. In India, you guys are lucky. Your weather is quite good in many places, many parts of India. You might be able to run a lot of things outdoors. But you see, even letting the teachers and letting everyone know that COVID is getting close to them, lets people know, let's start acting outside instead of inside, maybe for a week. And if you do that, you're also gonna drop R0 because actually that's funny. Then you still have the same number of blue connections. You can still talk to people, you can still run your activity, but you reduce the yellow probability because everyone knows now we go and take greater care. And you see, Originally, when I was telling people about this, they said, oh, come on, everyone is always taking greater care. We're always taking maximum care. That's not true. It's completely false. And I'll tell you why. Because maximum care is expensive. If you're really taking maximum care, it is actually going to, you're going to, you're going to have to buy an expensive mask. You're going to have to do things which are less efficient for business. We are not always taking maximum care. So what we need is we need an early warning radar that can tell you ahead of time whether or not now is a good time to take more care. So the way that we actually reduce R0 is by reducing the yellow probabilities. So if I want to compare and contrast the normal contact tracing, they reduce R0 by simply eliminating the people from the population with a potential overcount of huge factor, one over 10%. What if, you, what if you're quarantining 10 times as many people or locking down everybody? And what we're trying to do is we're trying to make a smart system where wherever the virus starts to spread, everyone finds out that it's getting close and starts to get scared. As they get scared, it transmits less. And then the virus also dissipates. Two ways to control the virus. And another contrast, the normal way, normal way is that wherever you have a positive case like this, you, you tell only those three people. What we do is whenever there's a positive case, tell everybody, tell everybody how far away all the way out to 12. We can tell 100,000 people. For each person who is infected, we could tell 100,000 people, hey, this person, got, somebody got infected, distance 10 away from you. Somebody distance five, and it's, maybe somebody is told it's five away from you. It's okay. 
It's okay because if you tell me somebody got infected distance five away from me, I don't know who it is. And I don't care who it is. I just care that it's five away. And I care that tomorrow it's four, right? My point is that this is showing how with the mathematics, what we've actually figured out how to do is to take the information about these infections and put them on the right measurement. The correct measurement is actually this graph theoretic distance, this degree of separation. Using math, instead of saying that, oh, there are some cases which are in like 10 kilometers away from you, that doesn't matter either. Doesn't even matter if they tell you there are cases one kilometer away from you. What's the chance you actually see them? But if there's somebody who you work with who lives two kilometers away and their son got it, you, you care. But for this, it would show up as a two and then you would know. You wouldn't know it's their son, but you would know that there's a reason to be careful. Okay, last six minutes of this talk and then we'll take some questions. Last six minutes of this talk, I wanna talk about how you get the blue, how you get this blue graph, uh, the blue network, because that's also fun. That's more math. You see, we use smartphones. Smartphones happen to have the ability to measure various things with their sensors. Everybody else on the planet was using either GPS or Bluetooth in order to find these distances, in order to find out who was around who. We refused to use GPS because GPS, as I told you, would compromise the privacy and it would make it so that we would know who's actually sick. We don't wanna know. So there's no GPS. And in fact, we believe that any of these apps that use GPS are actually quite privacy invasive. Bluetooth was what many of the other people used. And they used the idea that if you have two devices, you can use the Bluetooth signal strength to see how big is the signal that was received and then conclude how far away the other device is. This, this is based on something called the inverse square law. It's from physics, but it's also a mathematical relation. There's only one problem. Inverse square law doesn't hold. So the problem is that the inverse square law only works if you have no obstacles, if you have no, nothing for the, for the signal to reflect off of to become stronger than usual. Inverse square law says that as you get farther away, the strength of the signal goes down as the square of the distance, but that only works in space. And the problem is the earth, I mean, li life on earth is not space. And in fact, there have been researchers in Ireland who have even discovered that sometimes if you're walking farther away in a, in a railroad carriage, if you're walking farther away, the signal strength increases because of what's called additive, uh, constructive and destructive interference, addition of waves. So what we actually do is we do something else. We use ultrasound and we are the only app in the world that decided to use ultrasound. And that's because physics is important. My background is also, I, I, I learned some physics back in the day. And so when we were making the app, we did not believe that Bluetooth would work. It, would, it was actually against the laws of physics to use Bluetooth. It just wouldn't work. No matter how good your engineering is, it's against the laws of physics because of this inverse square law only working in the vacuum, uh, in, in the space. So we realized that you can use sound instead. And uh, why do we use sound? That's how you find out how far away a thunderstorm is. Sound travels 343 meters per second. And so if there's a thunderstorm, how you find out how far away it was you don't use the lightning brightness. Lightning brightness is the analogy, uh, is the analogous item to Bluetooth signal strength because lightning is electromagnetic radiation. Uh, the light from lightning is electromagnetic radiation. And so is, uh, so is Bluetooth, it's a radio wave. And so obviously we don't use the brightness to decide how far away the lightning is. And the reason is because the brightness, how, how bright we detect it is affected by so many things. How many clouds are in the sky? How hard is it raining? Are there trees? Am I in a house? Are there, is the window in the house small? Are there curtains on the windows? Am I wearing sunglasses? Too complicated. Uh, it's actually just impossible. But we use sound. We use the time it takes for the sound of the thunder to hit our ears and use the fact that the speed of light is so fast that basically light gets there instantly. We use the same concept here to find out distances. And the fun thing about this is if you want to find out distances with sound, this is related to trigonometry. This is related to trigonometric functions. And so I'll just put this as like a closing, closing thought for this particular talk. People often ask what good is trigonometry? So one of the main things that we do when we use sound is we need to actually even be able to tell if a device is trying to talk to you because you might be surrounded by 10 different devices, other people running the same app. 
And we want each one to have its own characteristic sound. Just like how if you're in a house, you know whether it's this person or the other person who's speaking. Well, what we do is we use what's called Fourier analysis. Fancy word, but actually the most important part of it is a certain trigonometric identity. So it, all we're using, I, I, I'm not going to go deep into this, but I'm just going to say this is an answer to people who are uh, learning in high school uh, certain trigonometric things and wondering if they'll ever be useful. So here's an interesting fact. Sound is a wave, okay? So there's a sound wave. And suppose you have a sound wave. And suppose this sound wave happens to be very nice. If this sound wave happens to just be sine x, now, of course, you have to rescale everything. Uh, this is x is, I guess, time. And it depends on what the frequency of the wave is. You might have sine x. You might have sine 3x. You might have something called a phase. It might actually not start at 0. But I'm just drawing something simple. Here's a neat fact. Oh, actually, I don't want to make sine x. Let's pretend that this was sine 2x. And this is so pretend this is the sound wave that my microphone just recorded. How do I know it's sine 2x? Is there any good way? Imagine that somebody played a sine 2x, which is like a constant note. How do I know it was that note? Here's where trigonometry comes in. If you decide to take this and you multiply sine 2x by sine x, OK, I'm going to do some contrasting. Now I actually have to draw something more carefully. Sine x is going to be slower. Right, sine two x. Oops, I missed. Sine two x has a uh, finishes its cycle twice as fast. So this is sine x. Okay. So if I were to draw these two, and if you multiply these two together, meaning that I have a function which is you know it's sine two x. This is what I've recorded. I didn't know it was sine two x, but I take sine two x and I multiply it by sine x. Pointwise, meaning that every single point I multiply the points. OK, then what I get is I get sine 2x times sine x. If I multiply the two together and I graph this, I, I, I won't be able to really draw a nice graph because I don't have a graphing tool here. But if I multiply these things together and I look at the area between these functions, this function and the x-axis, it's quite interesting. And this is something which is now going into high school mathematics. It's an integral. So now suppose we're integrating from 0 to some huge number. Let's call it L, L for some upper limit. And at this point, you can see I've, I've moved way beyond elementary or secondary mathematics. We're going into the calculus side, just saying that you know all of this stuff is related. But I'm about to do something inside here, which is used in trigonometry class. If you want to evaluate this, it turns out that this answer is actually never very big. It's never very big, even if L is huge. And the reason is because there's a trigonometric identity for sine 2x times sine x. What is that? You can write that in terms of cosines. Oh, uh, this funny integral sign, all that means is I would take a graph and I look at the area between the graph and the x-axis. And for example, in this picture here, the integral of just sine 2x, these give me positive contributions. These give me negative contributions that cancel out the positive ones. And then I have more positive contributions and more negative ones that perfectly cancel out the positive ones. So the notion of this integral is go from here to L and take all the positive contributions, add together, subtract away the negative contributions, see what's left. And the interesting thing is when you have a sine times sine, now here's where my, my memory is not very good. I don't really remember what this is. I think it's a half of cosine stuff. I think it's cosine of the difference. And here's where I'm glad we've got math teachers here. Maybe you guys can help me. I'm actually not confident I'm right. 2x plus x. Please comment in the chat if I have the sign wrong or if I have the addition wrong or something. I think this is actually maybe right, but it's somehow, there's a half here. This is based on some trigonometric identities where, okay, here's how, here's how I double check. It's cosine 2x, I'm evaluating the inside. Cos 2x, uh, cos x, 
and it's going to minus cos 2x cos x. Okay, that's good. And then this one would be plus sine 2x sine x. I think it's actually okay. I think it's okay. This is okay. So this is okay. Every time I look at these things, my memory is very bad. And so the way I do these things is I write down what it might be. And then I go and evaluate the insides and put together. Okay. And so this is okay. But why this is important is because, look, this is a normal trigonometric periodic function. This one is going to go up and down and up and down and up and down. This one also, this one's going to go up and down, and up and down. And so I'm going to find these area under the curve. Now it's going to run into my head, but this is cos x minus cos 3x dx. And the important thing here is that even if L is big, this is never going to be too big. It doesn't grow with L because I'm going to have something which keeps giving me positive stuff and canceling it all the way with negative. Positive, cancel all the way with negative. This one just does it three times as fast. Gives me positive, cancel away with negative. Positive, cancel away with negative. So this thing is bounded, that's what we call it, bounded even if L is huge, okay? So that's, that's, this is like telling you, this is a way of telling you that this was not sine x. So what you can do is if you take these integrals of what you measured with the, with the microphone, multiplying against other frequencies, when you multiply against other frequencies, because of this sum, this difference and sum, you'll always get things canceling out. But something nice happens if you happen to multiply it against its own frequency. So this is like a test. You're, you're curious, is there a sine 2x part of the signal? Sorry, this is test of, is there a sine x part of the signal that I just measured? And the answer is no, because it doesn't give me anything valuable. But on the other hand, if I did this, sine 2x, if I was testing it against sine 2x, I would actually find out that this has a different nature of behavior than what we just did. If you do the same, we can use the same trigonometric identity. Now I remember it, because I just did it. Cos 2x minus 2x minus cos 2x plus 2x. Well, now, now it's good because look at that, cos zero. That's strange. Cos of zero is one, cos 4x. And now this is very interesting because if you try to find out what's the area underneath this, this function is one which is averaging a value of, well, inside here, the, the bracket has an average value of one and it keeps oscillating above and below one. So actually, if you look at the area between this and the x-axis, you're going to be picking up on average half because it's half times one. You pick up on average half. So actually, as L gets bigger and bigger, we call it L goes to infinity. As L goes to infinity, this is what's called asymptotically L over two, which is extremely different in nature from what we had before. Before we had something where if you look at what happens when you integrate the area between, if you look at the area between the, the product and this x-axis, you basically get nothing that gets bigger or smaller because you keep adding stuff and removing the stuff. You know, you add the stuff and remove the stuff. This thing, this whole thing is actually periodic with period two pi, if you do radians, right? And so it's just going up and down and up and down. And furthermore, not just periodic, it's periodic and symmetric. It has the same amount above and below. Actually, what I've just used here is that with an integral, you can say that the integral of a difference is the difference of the integrals. Sorry, but that went a bit too much into, into the calculus side. But over here is that there's a fundamental difference in quality that there's a one sticking here. And the one, is actually not going to give you something that keeps adding and canceling. All right, I wanted to end this thing with something that went all the way out to here, just to show that, you know, a lot of math is useful. It's not only about reading graphs. It's not only about probabilities. It's not only about graph theory itself. It's not only about thinking of, you know, other ways to do things. You also can use calculus. But this is actually one of the fundamental components that went in. So ultimately, when we built the app, I actually was the person who wrote the, 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 the programming code for how we do our, son, our sonic testing uh, to find out how far apart devices are. And I can tell you, there's an awful lot of these integrals which are going on inside that software. 
All right, I've talked too long. I actually had promised that we were gonna do something that has Q&A as well. So I'm happy to turn to a Q&A side now. And you can also see, I chose to give the whole talk in a way which is like maybe using some of these digital techniques to even you know talk, talk about, well, I guess I didn't want to just give a talk about here's a way of teaching in 21st century. I just figured let's just do it. And then at that point, we can even di di dive into any of the techniques. I'm happy to answer any questions. The questions can be about COVID. They can be about math, about math education, about anything, or about technology, anything. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, there are lots of questions. Yes. I Could I ask minute. for you to be the moderator, please? It would be great, yes. if, because my vision is not very good at reading the comments. Yes, I will, so would I will you, would you be the willing the to play the moderator to just say, hey, here's a question, and I'll answer <laughs> it? Yes, I'll read them out. Before that, I had a comment, which is that sort of curious that you said ultrasound you're using and something to do with bats. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, you're right. So we're using the bat method to beat the virus that came from bats. Yeah, is that what you mean? <laughs> okay, anyway, so one of the questions is, self-reporting infection is based on altruistic motives, do you think? Self-reporting. Ah, <laughs> that is an excellent point because yes, the app that we showed has something which has selfish motives, which is to protect yourself. But it does require one piece which is altruistic, which is that if you actually do get sick, you do report inside. Let me explain how this is working typically. So in the United States, our first people that we're working with, first groups that we're working with are universities. Universities are trying to operate and schools also. So schools and universities are trying to operate and they somehow have agreements with their students that people should behave in a certain way in order to participate in this environment. So although there's an altruistic component, there's also a, 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 a self-interest component because the students actually want to come. And so if they want to participate, it has, it's actually quite normal for people to say, if you want to participate in this community, please be responsible. Uh, otherwise don't participate in this community. And one of the things that you can request is, uh, if there is this positive test, actually the, the school or the university is the one that generates the code and gives it to the student and says, hey, could you please enter this thing in? But there's a second piece which is very important. Unlike the other apps, we are okay if most people don't report. And here's why. In the other apps, the other apps only method of protecting the world is that every, every single case you isolate the people around it. If you miss any case, it's like a fire going in the rafters in the ceiling. You have no idea where the fire is. And if you don't get every single bit of it, the whole roof burns. Ours is different. Ours, you show everybody how far away the things have struck. Even if I only have a small fraction of those displaying, we are not trying to isolate the people around them. We're trying to show everybody else you run away. And so the point is, even if you only see a little bit of that red signal, it's enough. You see, because our method is we want to let people know that there's some fire in your area. And because COVID happens to infect so many people, if only half of them press, you still see something. And as long as you see something, you know to be careful. So that's how we work. Of course, we hope people are, we hope people are altruistic, but this whole thing was built so that it's robust. If you have lots of failures, it's mm -hmm. working in a different method so we don't need everyone. Okay. One more question. Is the mobile of the COVID infected person is the source of sound? The source of sound is the mobile of the person or? Oh, okay. Cell phone or? Yeah, so there's an important thing of what is the source of the sound? So the source of the sound is actually the mobile phone. So, uh, the exact way this works is that when the mobile phones are around in public, they are, they are scanning with Bluetooth to see if there's any nearby mobile phones which are running the same app. If they find that there's some other phone running the app because they've scanned it with Bluetooth, Bluetooth is how our apps talk to each other, then they agree using Bluetooth, the same way Bluetooth can make headphones, right? We use Bluetooth to communicate between phones and say, okay, your turn, you make a sound. And then that, person, that, that phone makes a sound and, and the phones, because they've been communicating by Bluetooth, we know exactly when the sound is coming and then we measure the time. So it's sound coming from phone, not sound coming from human. Oh, I see, I see. One more uh, very interesting question is, uh, how do you manage this integration of your video and slide in real time? I'm sure lots of people are- Yes, 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 yes. So I'm happy to talk about this. So this is now a technique called, um, I use a program. And, and this, this, is, this is where I just wanted to say, I didn't want to give the whole talk by saying, yeah, here's here some technology. I just wanted to show it 
And then after I show it, I can then talk about how each piece was done. Okay, so you saw that I just switched between two different screens. What I was doing is I was using a program called OBS Studio. There's a very important thing here. It is free. Free. Free is a very important word. So it's a completely free program, OBS Studio. And the OBS Studio works on many operating systems. It works on uh, Windows, on Mac. I'm happening to use it on Linux. I find Linux is the most stable, by the way. And also Linux is free. So, so I, I do this. But anyway, so OBS Studio, what does OBS Studio do? OBS Studio has the capability of combining lots of different things together and putting them into one stream. So if you download this program, it's, then there, there, are, there are other people who probably have guides on how to do this as, as, uh, as, as teachers have been trying to do this. OBS Studio is something where it's sort of like what a TV studio can do. You can put a bunch of different things together. Now, inside this OBS Studio, let me show you some things behind the scenes. So I have this OBS Studio. It looks like I'm writing on this board. But now I'm going to show you what is actually happening. So I'm going to go and uh, let me show you one of the inputs. Uh, one of the inputs is my camera. And now you will see that I will change completely. This is my camera. This is where I'm standing. Now you can see me for real. I am standing here in front of a green screen. Okay. And what is this green screen? The green screen uh, is a piece of green cloth. Okay. Nothing fancy. It's a piece of green cloth with one solid color. And when you have this piece of green cloth with one solid color, OBS Studio knows how to turn the green into transparent. Uh, it is important to make sure that this is properly lit. So we have some lights here. So there are some lights which are all pointing here. I have a very strong shadow behind me only because here it happens to be morning in the US and the light is the sun. The sun is low in the sky. So it's putting a shadow across, which is making it not look as nice. But as you can see, there's this green. So that's one component. So one layer is that there's this green thing. I will now turn this back on. And then once I turn this back on, then somehow I'm able to put anything else I want because I make some layers, right? And let me show you something else about the layers. Let me show you another one of the layers. Another one of my layers is just this. So now you don't see me. What you see is, the, is, is actually the output of my computer. So I have a computer. My computer that I'm writing on is a tablet. And that tablet is sending a signal into this OBS studio. I'll hold up the computer in a second. OK, so my computer is here. And if you can see, there's a wire. There's a wire coming out of the computer. Because the wire comes, this is, the, oh yeah, this is the tablet. This is where I can draw things. So I can draw anything I want on here. And you don't have to use a fancy computer. Um, any Android tablet you probably could do too. I know that I, I, I built this setup a long time ago before there were so many useful apps. I know there are some Android apps where you can kind of draw on your tablet and it already makes an image appear somewhere else. And you can, if you did that, you wouldn't even need this wire. But I'm showing you my setup. My setup is built three years ago. And so three years ago, what I did is I just took an HDMI cable that goes as if my computer is projecting to a screen. Oh, actually, I will say, to me, that's still the best way because that lets me do what I just showed you of suddenly switching between different things on the same computer because I showed you some movies, I showed you some websites. So really the best way is if you just get a computer that you can draw on and you output through HDMI, and the HDMI goes into your other computer that's running OBS Studio. That's actually what's going on. I have, I have some computer running OBS Studio. That computer running OBS Studio has one input, which is from the, from the drawing thing. And it has another input, which is from the camera looking at me. Okay. And the OBS Studio automatically merges them. And the OBS Studio, you use a virtual camera. So what's going into the OBS Studio is, so, so maybe if I draw the picture, what I have is I have my, um, I have my camera. I, I believe that there is a tech session tomorrow where oh, yes. we have an introduction to OBS. Oh, good. Oh, good. Oh, good. So this is very powerful and you, you, you'll enjoy it. Right. So, so I'm glad that you guys are doing this too. So I have the camera and I also have the drawing computer. These two things both go into the OBS. And then the OBS sends out what, was, what is called a virtual camera. And the virtual camera, I then put into anything I want, any app. So for example, Zoom, I just simply plug the virtual camera into Zoom and then I'm good. And so that's what it is. Okay. 
Uh, okay. Huh. What percent of population should use this app to make it effective? It's one of the questions. What percent of the population should use it to make it sort of effective? Right, right, right. So here's where I'll, I'll show you something that's quite interesting. So let me go here, just a second. So I want to go back to this. So this is, this is, it is indeed convenient to be able to pull this off. Uh, let's go here. So this is quite interesting. So I'm sharing now, uh, in the US, we use this website called Reddit a lot. I don't know if it's popular in India, but uh, in the US, somehow students, college students, I'll use Reddit. And so this is Georgia Tech, Georgia Tech's Reddit. Uh, and this is some student who lives in Georgia Tech. And they wrote this. They said somehow, I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger. Oh, nice, I made it bigger. So this is some student in Georgia Tech talking about their experience using Novid. And they said something about unbelievable charts. And actually, let me show you what they saw. This is what they saw. So if you, if you saw on the app that I was showing before, I was showing that somehow you can see things at a distance. Uh, you can see these red things saying how many infections there are. We also have something in the app which shows a blue chart. The blue chart is how many people you're connected to at all. And this person was very enthusiastic because they saw they're connected to a thousand people, not directly, but indirectly. So this is not the infected chart. They don't have this many infected people near them. This is just telling them how many people are around. But here's the key, they have two. And those two people have three. three. The way to read this chart is, this is a student. The student is spending time with two people. Now there are three people not counted among these three, and these three people spend time with those two. Now there are 20 people not yet counted among here who spend time with these three people, with some of these three people. And what you see is an exponential explosion where effectively the person has two contacts. On average, each of those has one and a half other contacts. This one on average has got like six contacts. This one on average about two and a little bit contacts. I'm just dividing, I'm dividing this number by that number, right? And then here we get suddenly something is growing faster. Uh, my division is not very good, but maybe it's around like time, times four-ish, right? And this is times two-ish. But the common thread is that each person has basically about two other people they're connected to. And then boom, you get this. So all we need, and by the way, once you see this, it's useful because the, the incidence, the prevalence of COVID in many places is around one in 500. And so this is already useful because you would start to be able to see some COVID cases coming towards you. Your, 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 your number of people you have inside, um, inside your scope, the number of people that you can see is already big enough. So the, the fraction of people that you need to have Novid installed. Oh yeah, let me show you one other fun thing. Fun thing, let me see. Do I have it here? Uh, let's see, does this work? No, that doesn't work. Mm, no, I don't know how easily to pull that out, but it's okay, this is good enough. So, so with this particular picture, you can already see you know, how COVID is, the, the, how, how the relationship structure of the network is. And it has big enough numbers that if there is positive cases, you'd find out. So okay. in that case, what do you need? You just need that every person has about two people that they're connected to who use it. And if you think about how many people you spend time with, that might be 10%. So if you get 10% of a community, you already get to see the blue thing I showed. 10% is nothing. So the, the reason why this is exciting is because all of the other methods, everyone was talking about how you need 60% of people to use an app before it's useful. Okay. That's where the math comes in. We come in with a different angle and somehow at 10%, you get some value. So one other question is whether your app is being uh, used in the US now? Uh... Yes, the app, so the way the United States works, is that we don't have a national system. So in the United States, every state does their own thing. And even within the state system, every university does their own thing. And every school does their own thing. We hope that this will change soon because our current status is that we are the, I mean, we're the leading app at this point. But uh, for example, we're being used at Georgia Tech. Uh, that's a massive university. Harvard has already piloted us. So we, we, are, we are moving out. There are other universities we've been working with that we don't announce before they announce. So I just can't tell you what are the names, but there are other universities that will soon also say they, they are also using Novid. And so what we expect to happen is because we went through the universities, um, a lot of these universities had done the research to go and compare all the different options. And when a university does research to compare options and then chooses an option, it's probably a good one. So we actually have a fairly reasonable expectation that as this thing becomes more and more known, this will likely run across US. 
And it helps because we are the only app in the entire world which came up with the idea of this pre-exposure notification of flipping it around. Yes, flipping it around, yes. There is one more question. Does the graph of contacts usually go down when you reach a distance of 12? Oh, no, 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 no. The only reason we show only 12 is because uh, there's not enough space on the screen. <laughs> it's, it's, this, is, this is actually it's completely based on screen limitations because if you see, if any of you have downloaded the app, you'll see we care a lot about the user experience design. And so we want it to be beautiful. We want it to be something that's nice to look at. And so 12 was all we can fit. And also mathematically, I'll tell you why 12 is enough. It's because the way the disease spreads, if you get to one, you are already in trouble. That means there's somebody that you spend a lot of time with who's positive. You don't want to get it to one. But the problem is it takes time for the test result to come back. During that time, people are getting infected. So you really want to get scared as soon as you see it at three. Yes. So our, our threshold is if you see anything land at three, you should be very scared. Uh, very scared means you take great care of yourself for about a week or two and let that, let that dissipate, right? But now, uh, in order to be able to see it reach three, you need to have some time to let the graph come across. That's why we said 12 is enough. And this is also a human psychology thing. If we started it at only six, by the time it gets to three, everyone says, what's the big deal? You know, like if I've got this thing, if I have a display like this, right? And, and you see that if it started only at six, when it gets to three, the person feels it only got halfway across. And I don't need to, scare, I don't need to get scared yet. Now here, if it gets to three, you've gone three quarters of the way across and the person feels like it's about to hit you. This is actually all human psychology. Uh, why 12 is this? And now 12 is also, we, we expect that if this thing was used, for example, in, in cities like New York City or in, in any, any city in India, your cities are quite large, you would actually have enormous numbers of connections at distances 13, 14, 15, 16, but not very relevant to you. The relevant things to you are when it gets to a distance of three. Okay. Okay, so I think there are lots of questions. Lots of people have commented that your talk went very well and uh, very happy. So I think there may be more questions which I can pass on to you later. Perhaps oh, sure, sure, sure. You. So it's an excellent uh, talk. And on behalf of the audience, uh, let me thank you once again. Wonderful. Oh, of course, of course. Yes, well, thank you. Thank you. So, take care. My pleasure. So thanks to all the participants also. I'm sure you find it very interesting. And we'll have more questions. You can perhaps pass it on later. <laughs>